Fantastic. Looks like we've got plenty of people joining. Welcome to it does. Uh, Sorry, go, go, Malia. No, I was going to say certainly does, Ben. I'm excited. <laughs> that, that, that participants counter is just jumping up. So we'll give everyone another uh, minute or two just to join the room and then we'll kick off. Um, welcome to everyone that has joined in. Hope everyone is having a fantastic day so far. If you're uh, in Adelaide, it is a beautiful day out there. I actually went for a little wander around the Botanic Gardens um, where we're based is just next door to that. So I had a little uh, stroll around there before this all kicked off, which was a, a nice little way to break up the day. What about you, Mel? Have you been out in the sun at all? <laughs> I was just about to say, Ben, oh, g'day to Nora from New South Wales. Oh, I, oh sorry, that was Tim. I love the recognition of country as well, Tim Collins. Um, yes, I have been, I launched a workshop with a new leadership group this morning, so I haven't had the chance to step outside yet, but hopefully after this I'll go and soak in some of that sunshine. Make sure you're uh, thriving for the rest of the day. <laughs> It's important. Awesome. Well, I would suggest the numbers are, are looking pretty good. Um, we're two minutes in to, to our scheduled time, so perhaps we'll um, kick things off. Well, hi, Jodie in Launceston. I'm missing that part of the world right now. Well, I have not been down to uh, Tassie for a while. Um, yeah, need, need to go. I went to a beautiful restaurant there many years ago called Stillwater. I think it's down in, I think it's specifically in Walt Seston. Um, so it's a fantastic part of the world. Oh, it's just glorious. Well, let's, uh, I think, get this show on the road. So welcome to everyone that uh, has joined in and, and thank you very much. Um, we're all here to talk about how we can take teams to the next level um, and go from simply just surviving to thriving. So my name is Ben Colley. I'm the COO at TeamGage. Um, and with me today, I have uh, two of the fantastic team and actually co-CEOs from PeopleQ. I have uh, Melina, um, who you can see up on, on the slideshow, um, and also Saria, who, as I've mentioned, is, is a co-CEO at PeopleQ. So what we're really going to do today is just uh, talk a little bit about, I suppose, some of the strategies and, and tactics and, and approaches um, and that's really something that Melina um, and the team at PeopleQ focus on. So we're going to hear from them. Um, as always, love to hear your questions and comments. So please put them up in the chat um, and we'll be monitoring that and, and interrupting as we go and, and bringing those questions out. But we'll also have time for a Q&A towards the end. Um, so before I do hand over to Melina, a little bit about Team Gage. So this is, I think, a the sort of perfect quote that comes from one of our co-founders, Noel. Um, why do we exist? Well, we want to help every team in every workplace to continuously improve the way they work together. That's the uh, the why behind what TeamGage does and, what, and why we come to work every day um, to keep building our team, our company, and, and our product. So how do we actually work? Well, TeamGage fundamentally believes on feedback is a fundamental way to actually develop and, and continuously improve. So we don't just want to do a, a once a year employee engagement survey. We want to be continuously asking the team about what's working and what's not, sharing those results transparently as an individual team, and then making decisions as a team and putting actions in place so that we can continu continuously improve. And it's really fundamental, I suppose, from our point of view that this is done bottom up um, and that teams have ownership and visibility into, like I said, how they're working well and perhaps what needs some um, focus or improvement. The philosophy, I suppose, that underpins Team Gage is one of continuous improvement. This is not a, a one-time only affair. This is the idea that you need to constantly be looking at the way you're working. You need to be constantly talking about that as a team, coming up and, I suppose, experimenting with ideas and and uh, new initiatives. And then once you've actually put them into practice is reviewing, well, did they make the change and did they have the impact that we were hoping? And if they didn't, that's fine. We, we learned something. 
Um, but if they did, fantastic. Let's celebrate that. Let's talk about that. Why did that initiative or why did that action um, have the change? And then we start that process again. And so that's that continuous improvement philosophy that underpins um, everything about what we build at Teengage. So that's probably uh, enough about Teengage and what we do, because really what we're here today is to hear from uh, Melina and Surya about PeopleCube and um, some of the amazing work that they do um, with, their, with their clients and, and our mutual customers. Thank you so much, Ben. I'm just going to share my screen, if that's okay with everyone. Um, and I, um, I just want to take a moment before I get started. If it's okay, I would like to read out something I wrote about acknowledgement to country. Um, and it's something that I've become, I guess, deeply intimate about um, of uh, late. And I'm loving some of the acknowledgements I'm seeing in the chats. So I'm going to read this out word for word, if that's okay. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Ghana people who are the custodians of the lands and the waters of the Adelaide region on which some of us are standing on today. And I also want to pay a deep respect to elders past and present. And we acknowledge and respect the Ghana people's cultural, spiritual, physical and emotional, emotional connection with their land, waters and the community. So thank you for that. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's get stuck into it if it's okay. Uh, Saria and I spent some time um, looking at, you know, we've got 30 minutes. It's a very short period of time to try and condense a really broad topic. So what's going to be beneficial for everyone? So we've kind of broken it up into three parts. Um, one part is we just want to spend a bit of time, I guess, sharing with you our observations, our research and our knowledge around, you know, what it looks like and what it feels like to thrive in the workplace. Um, and then the other thing was, I thought it was just, we thought it was important that we at least look at, you know, what are some of the markers or some of the things that you want to be aware of to recognise what burnout looks like um, or when we're in that survival mode. And then the third part is we wanted to be able to share some tips as well. We're not going to be able to go into too many. Um, and I have been known to try and squeeze too much into a short period of time. So Ben, Saria, slap my hand if I start to do that. Will do, Mel. Yeah, we'll get you on track, Mel. <laughs> Great. So before um, we kick off into all the, uh, the juicy content, we'd like to do a quick wellbeing check, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so you'll notice um, a little barcode. If you could grab your device or phone um, and scan the barcode and answer the question, um, the three words describe how you're feeling today. Ooh, energized. Overwhelmed, tired. Relaxed. Tired, overwhelmed, busy. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. Look at that board lighting mm. up. Lots yeah. of diversity in what we're feeling. Just a tip, Diane. I saw you said you don't have a QR reader. If you do have a, a smartphone, iPhone or Android, normally you can just hold your uh, camera over the QR. You don't actually need a dedicated reader. So just so you know. Sleepy. I love that. Mm. <laughs> Me too. I, I, I was kind of feeling a little bit sleepy as well. I'm just going to take a picture of this. I'm loving the diversity of what we're seeing on the screen today. Um, now, we have quite a lot of people on the call, um, and I just want to take a moment to just step back and observe, you know, if this is what we're experiencing 
um, just those on the call in this moment, imagine what's happening in the workplace all around us on a daily and a regular basis. Um, so it's really just about acknowledging that people are in different places and, and dealing with different things, but we're also sometimes experiencing both sides of, you know, being positive and energised and also overwhelmed all at the same time. There's a few more coming in. Um, ben, I love to start off with this. Um, I think it's important that before we go into any conversation, um, I really want to engage the audience in um, just taking a moment to pause and reflect on how they're feeling. It just kind of helps us to almost, um, you know, acknowledge that, observe that, but also, you know, press almost the pause button before we reset to go into a new um, conversation. But I also want to hold on to some of the words we're seeing on the screen today as well, because they really do talk to today's topic um, from surviving to thriving. I wanted to start with first sharing a bit of research uh, around this idea of a high performing workplace and a low performing workplace. And by the way, there, it is tons and decades of research around this, but this particular one really spoke to me for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's Australian um, and it's um, conducted by the University of New South Wales. Um, and I think it's really culturally relevant to, um, to the people in Australia today. Um, but the University of New South Wales did some research and, and they found that there are some things associated with a high performing workplace. Um, and I guess this for me is really about, you know, does it make sense to actually want to be motivated to aspire and work towards a thriving workplace? Um, and if you don't have a business case for it, here it is for all those HR directors out there today, right? Um, it, it, if we are um, operating with a high performing workplace, what we tend to see is much higher productivity, um, we also tend to see um, a better capability of achieving your financial targets, a better return on profit margins. Um, you know, the organisation becomes much more efficient at convert, converting its inputs into outputs. Um, and here's what every um, shareholder will love for every dollar invested, you get more return on it. So if you wanted a business case for it, this is where I'd recommend our audience to go. Um, to find those numbers. Um, but there's more reason that we would do it other than just having a business case for it. You know, for me, this is really about we spend the majority of our time working in the workplace, whether it's virtual um, or whether it's face-to-face -face or whether it's a combination. That's where we spend the majority of our time. So it makes sense that you would want to, you know, make sure that when you're in that space, when you're connecting with those people, that you're getting a sense of, I don't know, I'm going to say joy from it as well. Yes, there's going to be the ups and downs, but you want to get a sense of joy from it as well. So I did want to put this question out there um, to our audience, and I want to ask you to think about um, a thriving workplace and what words come to mind for you. Loving these words, Mel. Collaboration. But I just love them. I just want to hunt the word. <laughs> Sorry, Trust. guys, I get a little bit excited. It's amazing when you see words like, like trust and collaboration just are clearly so that resonates with all of us even though we're all over Australia potentially all over the world also different and yet there's these some fundamental um, approaches or ideas or words that just all resonate with each of us. Absolutely absolutely um, there's also a fair bit of diversity here as well so there's definitely words that resonate with all of us but there's also diversity 
Um, and I just want um, the audience to hold on to that. We don't have time to go into the nitty gritties, gritties of it, um, but people need different things from the workplace and we want to remember that. Um, there's a lot of different words there as well that talk to things like energy um, and um, there's a lot of themes around teamwork, collaboration and communication as well. I am just loving all of this because it's kind of validating some of the work we're doing, Ben, with um, your Team Gauge platform, which is amazing, and our clients that use the PQ Factor um, metrics as well. So I'm going to let this keep flowing in while I start to kind of transition and talk to the next slide. Um, we have, I'm fascinated, by the way, with high-performing workplaces. There's a number of reasons why I'm fascinated with it. Um, I like to think where I came from was an environment that um, high performance was something that was almost celebrated um, and looked upon with awe. So, you know, we were constantly looking for ways to achieve it. Um, but I'm also fascinated with it because I wanted to do a bit more deeper work to really try and understand, you know, what are some of the most important elements that are going to help us achieve that. Um, and additionally, with this um, second wave of positive psychology, some of the, I guess, themes that have come out of that is how we help individuals flourish. And so what we've seen in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, a little bit longer than that, is this trend in a discussion around, you know, well, what if we were to make the workplace one where everyone thrives, what would that look like? And so based on a fair bit of research that we've done, um, we have, um, I guess, devised what I like to call a bit of a roadmap. Um, and so when you think about what it is to um, just survive or when you're in burnout mode, what you're experiencing is, you know, this um, exhausted feeling, this fatigue, you've kind of got nothing left. You've exhausted all of your resources, um, a lot of constant stress um, and overwhelm um, where maybe you're just doing things and you're um, efficiently getting them done, but you really don't have that much um, energy in reserve. Whereas when we go to high performing, you know, there's more use of strengths that are occurring. People are a bit more adaptive. There's kind of more learning happening. And then we come to this idea of thriving. And I like to think of as thriving as being almost the next level on to high performing. Um, and when we're thriving in the workplace, I want to use the word energy because that's so important and so important to some of the tips we're going to talk about today as well. But you kind of have this sense of energy, um, this sense of, you know, almost form, forward momentum where you're engaged and you're motivated and you feel stimulated and you're also, you know, when I say growing, you feel like you know more, you understand more and therefore you can do more. Do we have a Q&A there, question? We certainly do. So uh, this one's, I suppose, um, a little bit specific to, to Team Gauge, but I uh, would love your take on it, um, Mel, is how do you recommend we genuinely use the information from Team Gauge um, that's being surfaced? Yeah. And improve the culture where perhaps the CEO or some of the leadership don't appear to value the feedback or act on it, um, or perhaps they're a little resistant to change yeah um and you know what i i have to say ben that's you know sometimes it's a common one um and so thank you for the question um and i have come across it before and um so this is what i would say first um for a ceo to be on board with it and we deal with more medium-sized organizations so we're constantly dealing with business owners um, there needs to be a bit of a business case for it. Um, and so if you can appeal to, I guess, what's important to them from a business case perspective, you might start to get a bit of engagement from them. So what I mean by that is they might then start to listen. And then from there, once you've got their ear, because they need to support it to be able to do this, 
Um, the best way to then implement this to improve culture is to look at where your priorities are. So what's critical at the moment? You know, are you experiencing high turnover? Uh, is your revenue not where it needs to be? Um, are people starting to, you know, talk about this kind of stress and overwhelm and you kind of feel like this great resignation is really lurking over your head? So if they're priorities, you then want to think about, well, what are the things we need to do in the culture to help people through this period to keep them there? Um, and it might be simple things like, you know, we need, we need to perhaps, you know, create a more inclusive environment or more connection in the environment. So then that's how I would use Team Gauge, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I think that that idea of um, understanding what's important to them, um, what we're talking about right now, like what's important for, for individual teams to, to thrive. Um, but there's also a reality that for a CEO or for the leadership, there's something that's important to them and, and the organisation. And so I think it's understanding what that is um, and, you know, we fundamentally believe in, in individual teams having ownership and the change being driven from the bottom up, but we also completely accept and, and, and want to work with leadership and CEOs to understand what's important to the whole organisation um, and what are they trying to achieve, what's their strategic objectives for this year or the next five years and find that balance between the two. Yeah. Um, and I think as well, um, if you're still struggling to get somebody on board and your CEO on board with that, um, I like to say project out for them what it might look like for them in two to three years' time because often they don't think that forward. Um, so you project out for them and show them what could possibly happen if you continue doing nothing. Um, and if they're happy with that, there's not much you can do about it. But the chances are, are they're going to want to go, okay, well, let's start talking about it. Um, Jennifer asked a question about how we support people to maintain positivity and a growth mindset. I, we've just, I've just come off a workshop where we've launched a program around building a leader's emotional intelligence. And I just want to say this. I think it's really important to acknowledge that there's absolutely diversity there, adversity there. Um, and that there's going to be difficult times. So we don't want to try and avoid, um, I guess, the negative in a situation. But Jennifer, in a few slides time, I'm going to share with you a tip around how leaders can, I guess, um, co proactively cultivate a more sort of optimistic mindset, because I think that's the key, is helping people create that optimistic mindset to move into that growth mindset as well. So just going back to thriving, so this for me is where the difference is between high performing, moving up to thriving. Um, it's this feeling of being alive and energised, this sort of progress and forward momentum that you feel you're moving forward. But with all of this, your knowledge is actually growing as well. And so we also wanted to take an opportunity to share with you some themes that we think are important to cultivating this thriving environment. And so when you look at tools like Team Gauge and you think, what kind of questions could I ask? Um, these are the themes that I would recommend you kind of focus on. And I'm not going to talk to all of them, but I do want to share, I think, a few that are really uh, close to my heart, Ben, if that's okay. Um, and this is this idea of connection. Um, it is so important that we feel connected to people. Um, it is part of building our resilience. And so it takes a fair bit of skill from a leadership perspective to really understand how you can do that and how you can nurture that. Um, but I also want to talk to this idea of purpose and vision, specifically purpose. You know, sometimes when we feel a bit helpless and lost or um, hopeless, um, we, we, we struggle to find meaning in the work that we do. So purpose is really this uh, deep sense of creating meaning and understand what the contribution is that you're making to the community or to others around you in the workplace. And that it's not just a job and you're not just processing invoices, you're making a much more bigger contribution than that. And we do do a fair, a fair bit of work with our clients in helping them to really unpack the organization's purpose. 
and I'm just going to go quickly back to this idea of the CEO who wants to change. I look at it, this is my acronym. You can all take it and use it by the way, but I look at it from the perspective that are you focused on, on only the two Ps or the four Ps? So if you're only focused on two Ps, it's profits for pockets. But if you're focused on the four Ps, you actually understand how important purpose and people are to get to the other two. They have to come first. At the end of the day, how satisfied your people are will determine the level of service your customers and clients are receiving and will also determine how your brand is perceived by the marketplace. And I love that. Mel. Like the, the why is so incredibly important. And um, I think often, you know, we, we see that the, the vision or the mission of the organisation can sometimes be taken as like it's a, a nice slogan on the website, um, but it's so much more than that. And that's why like the first slide that I brought up was the why Teamgate exists. We talk about it all the time, every single day. And, and sometimes it's sort of in conversation and casually and more often than not, it's actually formally as a whole team. And it's saying, we exist to make every team in every workplace work better together. Like that's why we're here. Um, and it's really important that we keep reinforcing that and talking about it because there are days when it's hard for whatever reason. And it's like, you, you forget the why and perhaps you feel like you're just moving the invoice from slot A to slot B. Um, but if you talk about the why, um, it's a good reminder of, of the reason that, that sort of you, you exist and your team exists and the organisation exists. Absolutely, Ben. And can I just say the reason why we started working with Team Gage is because of that, because there was so much alignment in our values, beliefs and our purpose, which is to have a positive impact on culture um, and it made it easy, I think, for us to also then have some robust and authentic conversation about how this partnership could work. And here we are now, two years down the track, um, and I'm so glad that the partnership is working. Um, but the reason why um, purpose helps um, you to thrive is because from an individual perspective, it helps you to see how, you know, what you're doing is actually going to make a difference, um, that it's not just a job. Um, and that in itself creates that engagement. I think as well, one of the other themes that is coming through strongly when we look at this idea of thriving is that from an organisational perspective, we look at putting some focus into creating some sort of wellbeing and mental health program to support the people in our business. They are there delivering a service to our clients. I think that they're the most important people right, because the better they feel, the more tools they have to actually navigate and overcome difficult situations, the better the outcome for our clients and our customers. Um, so it, I think it's important that we put some focus into that. Yeah, Mel, I've, we've just had a great question come in that I might yeah. throw to you if that's okay. Um, yes. so this, this comes from Carla and it is, um, we often think that the end goal of an organisation should be to create highly engaged individuals and high performing teams. Um, but in my experience, this is Carla's experience, just because a team is high performing or an individual is engaged, doesn't mean they won't suffer from burnout. And so how do we protect those individuals and, and those teams from that burnout? I thought that was a, a great question. Um, I'm trying to look through the Q&A to find the question there from Carla and I can't see it, but it is a great question, absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say this up front. And by the way, I when we do these kind of things, the one thing that I don't do is profess to be the expert in every single area because I have a deep belief um, that um, there's more benefit to the collective intelligence and that together we will do better things and, and better outcomes. Um, but in terms of burnout, I, you know, there are a few things that you can do to help individuals. And I think the first step is you've got to recognise what burnout is. Um, and then if you go back to this, one of these themes about a wellbeing program, I say think outside of the box. Some of our wellbeing programs at the moment that we're seeing because of you know, so many people working virtually are wonderful care packages where organisations are delivering care packages to the um, doorstep of their employees. Um, I just wonder if you could perhaps um, 
you know, engage a well-being expert or someone who does work in resilience to come in and offer some virtual training and tools to our people um, to help them build their energy levels. Um, and I'm just going to give our HeartMath program a little plug here. That's it. <laughs> um, but there are many people that do this kind of work. And I have someone that I collaborate and she offers wellbeing programs where they're all run virtually and you can get your people to come along. They're very cost effective, but it just gives them some tools. But I think the first step is recognising what is burnout and if burnout is any different um, to stress, um, because there is a difference between the two. Um, Mel, can I just quickly add my two little cents in oh, there? Yes, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Saria, I'm going to zip it. <laughs> um, no, you were on a roll, Mel, so I didn't want to um, disrupt you. Um, but just to Carla's question, the other simple thing you can do is just make sure your team take their leave um, and that they have they have regular breaks and that they, you know, they don't get to that point where, you know, they're, they're feeling burnt out. So that's something simple that all leaders can um, manage quite easily is just making sure that they're taking their leave. Thanks, Mel. You're welcome. <laughs> um, can I just add to that as well? Um, one of the tips I we gave one of our clients was to say, you know, if you're having a one-to-one -one virtually or remotely with one of your team members, go out for a walk together <laughs> um, and have that one-to-one. -one. And there's a few reasons why you do that. When we're in nature, it energizes us and it helps us to renew our energy levels. Um, so it's a good way to kind of start thinking about burnout from the perspective of energy um, and how we can renew energy. So go for a virtual walk with them. The other thing is when we're actually walking together, our brains tend to become in sync and a bit more aligned. Um, so it might be even a difficult conversation about something that's happened. Um, you might find that as they're renewing their energy by taking a walk outside and there's a bit of air around and blue skies and a few trees on the street, um, that you might find it a bit easier to then have that difficult conversation um, and try and reach a positive resolution together. Yeah. Oh, Cassie, that's a good one. I do not love that. <laughs> Leave your problems at the door as you enter the workplace. Um, we are everything that we bring. <laughs> um, and it's really hard for people to try and avoid or push under the surface what they're experiencing. My preference is to go in in an empathetic matter, if in an em in an empathetic um, way. If you see someone is struggling, take a moment to take them aside as soon as they get there, um, and you know, exercise a bit of empathy. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do? What can I do to help you get through the day? Um, and just kind of help them, you know, talk about whatever it might be and reset before they go back into the environment and start the day. Um, trust is a big one as well, Cassie. I don't think we have too much time to unpack trust. Um, we're going to try and leave you, though, with a tip around trust because there are so many complex elements to it as well. But what I would like to say, though, is this, I, and I think this is really important to acknowledge, um, and you said it right at the beginning, Ben, um, culture is not a project. It is not something that you go, I'm going to leave that with the HR director or the leadership team to work on as a project, and then they can come to us. Um, culture is something that is continuous, it's ongoing, um, and culture is as a result of how we all behave in the environment. So to cultivate a thriving organisation and a thriving culture, I believe it starts with us, the individual. Um, and to build that positive culture, it has to start with us as well, because we do have an impact on those around us. Um, so you've got to be first accountable to yourself before you can hold others to account or be accountable to others. Um, which means it's an individual thing as well as a collective thing, um, as well as something that goes across the organisation. But just quickly, burnout, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try and go through this really fast, Ben. 
Um, and Saria, just jump in whenever you want to. Um, but I wanted to share with you these two definitions of burnout. Um, and funnily enough, um, these date back many decades. I'm not going to say how far, but they're far back. Um, but I think there's some themes here. And some of the themes are that burnout is as a result of something that's more longer term. It's ongoing. It's relentless. But what it's also doing is it's it's zapping all of our energy from all the different areas um, and it's almost leaving us depleted of any resources. Um, so it's not just physical burnout, it's not just cognitive or mental burnout, it's emotional, it's physical, um, it's cognitive and it's also spiritual burnout as well. Um, and it's this idea of being sort of frustrated or almost disillusioned as well with where everything is going. So something fun that um, I'm going to leave this with our um, audience to think about silently if we want to try and recognise where our relationship might be with burnout um, or where um, those in our teams might be. Here's a really quick fun quiz. It's certainly not extensively and it's not covering everything. But what I can say is this to the audience, um, and this is very personal, I have personally experienced burnout. Um, and I can tell you I could probably tick very often to all of these at that point in time and so much more. And I wish I had the tools back then to be able to navigate it. I have them now and I'm feeling so much more like I'm thriving, even though I can get exhausted. Um, but it's really important. And this is what I mean by it's individual. You have to make a choice. I had to make a choice to recognise it within myself and start to want to do something about it. So let's talk about um, individuals and what we can do about it. And this talks back to, this goes back to one of the earlier questions um, about growth mindset and a positive work environment. Um, so one of the things that we can do is build our resilience. Um, and this is our personal resilience. And in doing that, we can also share those tips and tools with our teams and those around us. And when you look at resilience, by the way, resilience is a growing field of research. There's only 12 formal definitions right now, but it actually is growing um, every day. So there is no doubt that this will continue to change because it's quite a broad topic. Um, but there are some commonalities to all of those um, definitions. And those commonalities are this, is that, is that resilience is dynamic. So it's not like you build it and then you keep building on top of it. It can go up and down. Um, so to say I'm feeling resilient, I'm resilient because I've navigated such difficult circumstances behind me doesn't mean that you will maintain that level of resilience moving forward. So it can be dynamic. Um, but it's also about where we place our attention and how we choose to adapt um, in that moment of adversity. And so when we also talk about the areas and the domains of resilience, and I want to give credit to HeartMath here, um, we want to think about building personal resilience in more than one area. Often we go internally, Ben, and we go, right, I've got to think through things differently. I want to broaden my perspective. I want to have a growth mindset. Um, but actually, you want to look at all of these four domains in terms of how you might build your personal resilience. Um, so there's um, the emotional domain, the cognitive domain. Spiritual is about our values, our beliefs, the essence of who we are. And there's also physical um, resilience as well. So you want to make sure that you're taking some action across all of these. And um, I was just going to say, I love that idea of, of the different areas. And, and that, I suppose, speaks to me from a, the idea of like compounding. And so it's not that it's just one area or then the second area. It's if when you're working on both of those kind of independently, they actually reinforce each other and then become greater than those individual kind of areas that you've improved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just want to talk to one of the comments that has come through, um, and I absolutely agree. Um, speaking from my own experiences, once you hit serious burnout, um, it can take months to recover. Um, and I can tell you, Ben, I took months to recover. 
And I think this is why it's important that if we want to create a thriving environment, we've got to acknowledge that, you know, people might be close to burnout. And if they are the heart of our business, what can we do? What tools can we share with them to help them before it gets to that point? Um, because unfortunately, I did get to the point where from a health perspective, it actually had an impact. Um, and I think I spent three months almost sleeping just to recover from part of it. And, you know, I, you know, other things since then as well. Um, but back to these domains and back to things that we can do at an individual level. Um, so the first is that everyone's going to have different strengths in those four areas. So there's going to be, be things we already do well. For example, some people might be really good at um, being disciplined around going to Pilates or the gym or running on a regular basis. I wish it was me, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so recognise where your strength is and then recognise what some other things are that you can do in some of those other domains to bring some balance to where those energy leaks might be so that you're not depleting your resources. Um, there was a question as well around the skills that leaders will need to be able to, I guess, you know, navigate from surviving or burnout all the way through to thriving. Um, and these are some of the key skills that you're looking at. I talked about before the person who's got a strength in um, physical resilience, they're really disciplined, right? Well, it's really important to be disciplined around all of those areas. And of course, that kind of level of awareness to know before you get to burnout, I need to pause and I need to take control and accept that it's time to do something differently. No, just on that, I think that, that ties in really nicely with one of the questions that have just come through. And it's, what can you do about a workplace that you can clearly see is heading into that burnout phase, but perhaps that's actually not being seen by the leadership team? Well, I, so I say it starts with you. So if you've got some of these skills, if you've got some of this knowledge and understanding, and if you've got some of these tips, start sharing them with people. I'm an overcarer and I'm an overgiver. So um, when I see it around me, I will say to someone, do you want to catch up? Um, and I will purposely go into that conversation to see what I can do to support them. Um, so I think it starts with you. But at an organisational level, again, it comes back down to what are your priorities? Um, and, you know, maybe if you look at these skills, by the way, they actually link to emotional intelligence. So if you feel that your leaders are perhaps needing more support and development, remember Thriving is growing, um, you know, why don't you engage in some sort of program for your leaders to start helping them to develop these skill sets so that they can make a difference? Um, and the other tip that we mentioned earlier on is about that well-being program. But be really out of the box with it. Why wouldn't you put in some yoga passes or some Pilates passes into it? By the way, I've started Pilates recently and I'm just loving it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd also add just to, to ever submit this question. It's a great question. And I'd surface or, or share as sort of transparently as you can, what is it that you're noticing? Um, so something that, that we believe about a team game, that's why we build what we build is that the, the product, I suppose, helps to surface that in a, in a dashboard. It's almost like an independent observer, um, but ultimately the, the results are being driven from the team. But whatever you're noticing is, is perhaps speak about that and shine a light on it. Um, and that might be the first step that helps to, uh, I suppose, guide those leaders to recognise that there's something going on. Absolutely. Um, I'm just conscious of time. <laughs> so am I, Mel. So am I. Uh, okay. And Saria, you yes. know, I've just talked too much. <laughs> I know. I just can't shut you up, Mel. No, that's what that's what I love about working with you. Um, and one of the other things we do to make it fun at work is to uh, quote each other. Um, so, <laughs> Mel, if you can just go back to the last slide. Um, I guess, you know, we all know that relationships are, are foundational in leadership. But if I can just give everyone a quick anecdote, um, a CEO I worked for um, and highly respect um, used to always say to me, 
you know, be soft on people and tough on performance. And whilst at the time that resonated with me and was an excellent tip, it always felt like I was walking a bit of a tightrope um, and it felt like it had two separate components, the people stuff and the performance stuff. Um, and since the pandemic, we've experienced some shared challenges. I think we all have. Um, and I've been talking to lots of leaders um, out there about what's been the shift for them. Um, and there's been this notion, I guess, of humanising performance, particularly as work has moved away from the office. Um, so I don't know about, um, you know, our viewers today, um, but I've certainly noticed and been more aware of the human qualities becoming more accurate success measures. Um, for example, care and helpfulness and um, thankfulness, collaboration, um, they're trumping those traditional measures of success. Um, but when you also tap into your EQ and lead with empathy uh, to humanise performance, what you're really doing is building a level of psych psychological safety and connection. Um, and that's really the foundation um, uh, for thriving teams. Um, and so by creating a sense of belonging and safety, um, you're able to then bring your, your full self to work, as Mel um, mentioned earlier. And from this place, um, you're able then to, to start to build on optimism, which is the next part of our um, content. Thanks, Thanks Maria. <laughs> ben, I'm going to speed through these slides because I am conscious I've gone over time. But I, I think it's really important that we share this particular tip because um, it goes back to, I think it was Cassandra's question around growth mindset. Um, so there are some things we can do to help create a more positive environment, but what we don't want to do is diminish the negativity in a situation. Um, but what we can do is start to recognise that actually our brains are wired to have a negativity, uh, to have a bias towards negativity. And because of that, that's where our attention goes. Um, so, you know, that's something that I would share with people in the workplace. It makes sense why we can sometimes spiral when something happens. Um, so we recommend pause, take a pause, um, and then encourage those around you to say, okay, what if we, rather than saw this as a threat, what if we saw this as a challenge instead? Um, and I don't know about you, but the minute I say the word challenge, I kind of tend to relax because then it's like, oh, okay, this is something that I can overcome. Um, and what else you want to do is maybe just, I call it hunt for benefits, look for the good in the bad. Um, and I've had to do that myself through COVID. And I know that those people that have um, encountered these long lockdowns have been doing a lot of that of late as well. And then we can also look at how we build this optimistic style of thinking. So here's another tip, and this is going to be in the handout. Um, when we are less optimistic and something bad happens, I want you to think of six letters. Well, actually it's four, PPP and TIE. <laughs> and so what we wanna do is help our people to shift their thinking from PPP to TIE. Um, in a um, difficult situation, if I'm not an optimistic thinker, I'm generally going to think that it's you know, probably more permanent, it's gonna have an impact on everything. Um, and that, you know, there's no, there's no use putting some effort in. It's not going to change anything. I don't have any power in this. Um, so you want to try and help the person and challenge their thinking and even challenge your own thinking. I have to do this, even though I'm highly optimistic, there are times when I have to do this with myself as well. Um, so you want to get people to kind of shift from thinking it's permanent to it's temporary. So is it really something that's never going to change? We know COVID has been going on for 20 months. Um, and I hate to say this, it might go on for another 20 months, but it's still temporary. At some point, you know, there's a roadmap and it's going to start to get a little bit better. So from a work perspective, if something happens, there's change happening, no one is liking it, it's going to have an impact on the divisions and how we interact with each other, you know, talk about whether that change is always going to make people feel like that. Or is it going to get better as we get used to the difference and the change in working, for example, in a hybrid workplace? Um, the other thing you want to do is um, get people to challenge their thinking on whether it's actually impacting everything. 
you know, something goes wrong with a new product or you launch, launch a website and I've been, you know, guilty of this. You go, oh, my God, it's going to have an impact on all of our products and services. Well, n- not really. It's probably only going to have an impact on one or two things. So challenge people to go from pervasive to isolated. And the same with the last one as you progress through this. Um, this is about going, well, actually, if it is only temporary and isolated, if, if we did something, what could we do? Where's the effort? So it's really understanding that you've got to take people on a journey before you go, hey, we're going to be positive and, you know, we really want you to tug on a growth mindset. Take them through this journey first. And the other thing I've got to say is from a leadership perspective, it just it takes a lot of effort to do that as well. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to have to bypass trust because we've just run out of time. And this is what I want to talk about. This is why we use Team Gauge. Um, we love the Team Gauge platform because what it enables us to do is to work with our clients and on a monthly basis, turn the intangibles into tangibles, something that the leaders can actually see and actually work with. And so we have six key metrics that we focus on around leadership, employee experience, trust, team communication, and customer. And so I want to share this with you. This is a case study because I think this for me says it all. This is the client that we've taken on a journey and there's a lot of work we've done with the client and they've done with others as well as part of this journey. But using the team gauge dashboard and using those metrics has helped them to kind of focus their effort and has helped all of their leaders to focus their effort. And look at that. This is the overall um, number where they started back in March last year. They started at 80. And look where they are now. I mean, that for me is a telling story. Um, And I just want to wrap it up by saying this. Not only have they seen an increase in their numbers um, and not only have they seen improvement across all of their teams, what they've also experienced is higher productivity, higher financial gains, um, better brand awareness in the marketplace, and now everyone is talking about their brand as well. Absolutely love that, Mel. I think that that's something that's so critical to what we do and what we believe in at Team Gage is, you know, all of these effectively, like you said, sort of intangible qualities and, and characteristics that we all know are important, um, or at least most of us do, and we all want to strive to have and celebrate. Um, but sometimes it's hard to actually justify that to build the business case or to appeal to the, the CEO um, and that's why we really believe in also sometimes having just the numbers and actually being able to see that laid out before you um, and at the team level and then sort of extrapolate that up to the entire organisation level. And that's so critical. If well, I, can, I was just going to say as well, it, it's, that case study, Mel, is so powerful. We, we've spent um, like just in the last uh, few weeks ahead of um, today's presentation, um, thinking about thinking about that particular organization and their journey um, and it's it's been such a powerful journey that they've been on um, and you know a lot of it comes down to having that shared purpose um, but also having some measures in place so that they can track how they're actually performing in terms of engagement but um, Mel and I were debating um, last night, actually, that they started on 80, um, which is actually a really good score. So, you know, really, they probably went from performing or high performing to thriving. So there's certainly a case study, I would say, that has achieved, have, has achieved thriving. So good on them. I think there's somebody that um, made a comment in the chat box about, you know, high performing is really just the start. And I agree, you mm. know, that's just the start. Thriving is where, you know, everybody becomes energised and we're just, I'm so passionate, we're just so passionate (laughs) about helping people to achieve that and that's been why I love the Team Gauge platform and I'm going to say it again, I love. (laughs) (laughs) I I I really appreciate that, Mel and Saria. Thank you so much for for all of your, um, yeah, all of us, the wisdom you shared with us today, That, that was so insightful. Um, and lots of practical tips and um, love the, the, the PPP and Thai mental models. Um, that's definitely one that really resonated with me and I'm going to take away. Um, 
as we do, thumb to gun at the end of the hour. I just wanted to let everyone know that is on, on the call today um, that we do have a couple of other upcoming events from Teengage. So the first is another webinar. You can see here it's on the, the 11th of November. And it's all about um, what sort of, I suppose, your role as a leader in all the change that's happening and what does your team want from you? Um, so that's what we're speaking of. So please jump on our LinkedIn or website um, to register for that one. We'll also send out a link to register at the end of this, uh, this session today. And then on the 16th of November, we're going to do a live demo um, so you can learn more about TeamGage specifically. So if you're interested to learn a bit more about our platform and, and how it works, um, please do come along to that. A couple of quick reminders. Um, at the end of today, um, probably within the 30 minutes or so, you're going to get a little feedback survey. We fundamentally believe in feedback. So please do share with us um, what you thought, the good, the bad, uh, the ugly, if there is any. Um, this will come out via email, as I said. And then please do connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, we've both got obviously company pages um, for people here in Teengage, but feel free to connect with us um, as individuals as well. Um, we'd love to keep the conversation going. So with four minutes left to go, I think we did a, a pretty good job there. So I am gonna just leave us with uh, one question that came through um, that we didn't get a chance to answer, but I think with four minutes left, we can do that. It was, what are some simple or, or practical tips or tactics to increase cohesion at the moment across the team with everyone working hybrid and, and, and in different circumstances? So Mel, any, any practical tips you can share? I, look, there's so many, but let's just focus on um, let's focus on three, if it's okay. Um, <laughs> I focus on one, but let's focus on three. Uh, communication. I think it has to start with open and transparent communication, and what that does is it also helps to validate and build trust in the team because trust is really important to that cohesiveness. Um, and then the other thing is um, inclusivity. I think because at the moment we're not necessarily sitting in the office where we can visually see everyone. You know, if we're bringing people together to discuss something, um, we, you know, we can visually see who needs to be included and who doesn't. Um, so make sure, take a moment to pause and make sure that you're absolutely including everyone that needs to be included. So inclusivity and communication. Um, and trust, we don't have time for it, but it's about building trust as well. That's how you get to cohesiveness. Oh, and just one other quick one. Try and find where there's similarities, where we have, you know, I don't know, shared values or um, shared goals. Because if I feel like I'm more like you, I'm going to want to collaborate with you a bit more. Love that. Uh, with two minutes to go, Syria, anything, any practical tips from your end? I certainly have one, but um, do you have one to share? I'll go on, Ben, if you've got one. Oh, I've got one. So something we do in our team is um, every single day we, we start with a, an open Teams call, so using Microsoft Teams, and we basically do a stand-up. And um, it's across the whole organisation. And to be fair, it's probably not the most uh, productive time in terms of a traditional stand-up. Hey, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm going to do today. This is where I'm blocked. But it's just an incredibly powerful and fun way to start the day. And we have people that are at home, people that are in the office, people that are mid-commute, dropping the kids off. And we will dial in and kind of start the day together. We go around the room. We get it done in 15 minutes um, across 20-odd people. Um, but it's just a really nice way to maintain that cohesion. Um, so that would be something I'd suggest if, if you can implement in your own team. Um, it's just a really beautiful way to start the day. Absolutely, Ben. Yeah, Mel and I are a fan of that. We were just talking about it earlier about, you know, we've noticed that with some organisations, those stand-ups or those meetings that they used to have have sort of fallen to the wayside since, um, you know, working from home. Um, but absolutely, we would encourage you to keep doing that, using technology as an enabler um, to continue to connect with people. Fantastic. Well, thank you to everyone that joined in today. Uh, I hope that was useful. Thank you so much to Saria and, and Mel from PeopleQ. Um, as I said, there'll be an email coming out shortly with everyone's details, links to the slides, um, a recording. Um, so I hope everyone has a, 
an amazing rest of the day. Get out there and enjoy the sunshine if you can. Um, connect with your team where you can. Um, and like I said, just enjoy yourselves. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben and Claudia and Hannah for all that you do for us today and with all of our clients as well. And also the other Ben as well. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. Bye, later. everyone. Bye.